Having a quality group of wide receivers is critical for the development of any young quarterback. Today we are talking Zach Wilson's wide receivers for the 2022 season on the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com, and it is Thursday, August 4th, 2022. A big shout out to subscribers to this podcast. To join that group, just hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching, and you'll get a notification as new, new episodes are posted. You'll never miss an episode of Locked On Jets. If you're watching on YouTube, please give the episode a big thumbs up. It helps the channel out, and it helps other Jets fans find this podcast. Our episode today is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online, available to people worldwide. And they have a special offer for listeners. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn. Well, training camp continues for the Jets. They have their big green and white practice at MetLife Stadium on Saturday night. It's also a big year for Zach Wilson. I don't need to tell you that. The second-year quarterback looks to bounce back after what was a pretty difficult rookie season. You look across the league, you look at quarterbacks who have developed recently, there's a common thread. Their teams help them out. Their teams give them good coaching. They put them in a good system. Hopefully, they give them a good offensive line, a good run game. But yes, young quarterbacks who develop usually have good receivers. And today, we're talking about the receivers on the New York Jets roster right now. Now, I think there are a couple key points when we talk about Jets receivers. The first is that the Jets actually have quality receivers on this team, which is quite a departure from the way things have been handled with past young quarterbacks. The Jets have many failed young quarterbacks over the last decade, from those who actually showed potential, like Mark Sanchez, Geno Smith a little bit, Sam Darnold, to those who had no potential, like Bryce Petty and the ultimate no-potential guy, Christian Hackenberg. The common thread is that the Jets have done a horrible job giving these young quarterbacks receivers. Outside of the first couple of years of Sanchez, it's been ugly. They've failed in many different ways. Uh, With Sanchez, the first failure was they gave him a bunch of old guys who were kind of malcontents back in his third year, 2011. Then the receiving core just kind of fell apart, stayed that way with a couple of years off when they actually got a couple of guys who could play in Brandon Marshall and Eric Decker. But by the time Sam Darnold was here, It was over again. Zach Wilson has quality receivers. I'm not sure he has that go-to guy, though. He might, but I don't think that this is going to be a receiver-dependent football team. I've been talking about it a lot. I think this is a team that's going to want to run the ball. I think the Jets are going to be a run-first football team. They're going to look to establish the run. They have invested at the running back position, and I think they've done an excellent job there. I think this offense is going to run through Brees Hall, the running back, and then also to a lesser extent, Michael Carter. And that kind of brings me to the guy who I think is going to be the top receiver on the Jets this year, Elijah Moore. And if you look closely, you can kind of see where all the pieces fit, because I think Elijah Moore has great potential, looks like a dynamic playmaker, especially the middle part of last season. He really looked like he was coming along before he suffered what turned into a season-ending injury. But it's pretty obvious that Elijah Moore is a kind of an undersized guy. And I think you wonder a little bit, can he handle the beating that comes with being a go-to guy with the number of touches that come with being the guy the offense revolves around? I think it's an open-ended question, but I think that the Jets have kind of set themselves up that Elijah Moore is not going to have to take the king-sized amount of touches on this offense because, first of all, things are going to run through Brees Hall and Michael Carter in the run game. But they've also surrounded Zach Wilson with a pretty deep group of pass catchers. And I'll give you an interesting stat last year. Football Outsiders has this tremendous almanac. I highly recommend buying it. I I love reading it every single year. They have a comprehensive preview of the NFL. They have detailed chapters on all 32 teams. One thing of note last year is that the Jets tied New England for the lowest percentage of targets that went to the guy who was whoever the number one receiver was on the play. 
Now, that could change depending on the personnel grouping you have. But the Jets like to spread the ball around. Maybe it was a little too complex for Zach Wilson, but I think that also shows you that beyond the way the Jets are going to take up, take on this run game as kind of the leading factor on offense, it shows you they're, they're not going to want to circulate the ball just to one receiver. They're going to want to really spread things around. And that makes sense when your best receiver is somebody like Elijah Moore, who can be electric when the ball's in his hands. It was tremendous route running ability. I mean, early last season, even when he wasn't producing, I'll tell you, I was watching the film. He was getting open a lot. Zach Wilson either wasn't finding him or he just wasn't the guy the Jets called the play for in the progression. But Elijah Moore, I think all season last year, looked really good. And then around the midway part of the season, the Jets started figuring out ways to just manufacture touches for him. You know, you don't have to depend on a guy getting open and running the full route tree. Now, Elijah Moore was doing it, but if you're having trouble getting the ball to a playmaker in the conventional passing game, you figure out how to scheme up touches for him. You throw him the ball on some screens. You throw him some smoke routes when the corner's giving too much cushion. When a smoke route is corner's playing like 10 yards, off, 10 yards off your receiver, quarterback just looks over. He makes a signal, and he throws the ball out to his receiver and lets him make a play. They figure out how to manufacture rushes for him in space, whether it's an end-around, uh, whether it's something else. And the Jets did a good job figuring that out. And Elijah Moore looked like he was really breaking out around the midpoint of last season, which I somewhat hesitatingly must point out that that began after Zach Wilson left the lineup. And even when Wilson returned, I think things got a little bit better. So, But it wasn't everything it could be. Hopefully with training camp this year, that connection really starts to build. But Elijah Moore, and you, there's the one play that comes back to my mind over and over and has over the course of the offseason was actually one when Joe Flacco was playing quarterback, a long touchdown he had against Miami. where it, And it, that to me is the play that showed him that showed his ability to be a threat anywhere on the field. It's been a long time since the Jets had had a player who you felt like could score from any point on the field, but Elijah Moore has that breakaway speed, playmaking ability, I think even short area quickness to be a really special player in this offense and a really dynamic threat in this Jets passing game and also get involved a bit in the run game. And I think he's probably going to be the top receiver on this team. And you know, this time last year, all, all anybody would talk about was how great Elijah Moore looked. And then this, he suffered an injury in training camp. It was actually a day I was there. And he began the season slowly, and everybody was getting upset. And I tell you, I was watching the film. I said, this guy's getting open a lot. Live. They're just not figuring out how to get him the ball. They will. It will come around. And once it did, it was something pretty dynamic. Now, again, I don't think Elijah Moore is going to be the focal point of this offense, but I do think the Jets' run game is going to help Elijah Moore because if the Jets are able to run the ball effectively, it forces defenses to play up. You know, It forces defenses maybe drop that extra safety in the box. And this is, I think, a Jets passing game that's going to be heavily influenced on play action. You know, I don't think that they, I don't know that they have that conventional superstar guy, but I think what the, the way this offense is designed, it's to kind of help free up receivers through the way that they operate because play action move, manipulates defenders. It moves them around. Uh, every defender in the front of the defense begins any play with two assignments. They have their run assignments where they're typically assigned one or two gaps, and the gap is the area between either an off, one offensive lineman and another offensive lineman or an offensive lineman and a tight end or, in the case of some tackles, the guard and the end of the line. But they're typically either given a man to cover or a zone to cover in the passing game and their first read is typically the run so if it looks like it's going to be a run they have to move up and they get put completely out of position and that's the type of thing it's the type of thing that manipulates defenders it allows receivers to take advantage of it and, and additionally if you're running the ball effectively and you're forcing other teams to play an extra safety in the box it leaves easier matchups for your receivers one-on-one -on -one. now i think one thing that's going to be interesting this year is to see whether or not the Jets make more use of Elijah Moore in the slot. And that's true of everybody. Last year, I you know, I looked through it. I looked through the film. I looked through some of the numbers. The Jets had very specific defined outside receivers and inside receivers. Braxton Berrios and Jamison Crowder were the inside receivers. Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, Keelan Cole, these were the guys who were the outside receivers. And part of that may have just been due to Crowder and Berrios' inability to really move outside. It was... And I'm not saying that it was 100% of the time, but it was about a 75-25 split. The outside receivers were outside about 75% of the time and in the slot 25% of the time, whereas the inside receivers, Crowder Barrios, they tended to be in the slot 75% of the time and only outside 25% of the time, 
with the addition of Garrett Wilson, a guy who may be able to do a little bit of both, could more see more time in the slot? Could Corey Davis see more time in the slot? I think that's an interesting question because these guys have all both Davis in uh, the pros and more in college have shown some ability to work out of the slot. So you may see Elijah Moore get more favorable matchups. The Jets can maybe move him around a little bit more frequently than they did last season when they were a little bit more limited in the roles they could give their receivers. So this is a spot that could create more matchups for Elijah Moore. They could maybe utilize him in different ways on screens from the slot this year. But I have high hopes for Elijah Moore. And I think the pieces, the way they've built this thing, kind of fit. I, I think that a smaller guy like Elijah Moore, maybe you don't want him getting all the, maybe you don't want him getting the touches you'd normally give a number one receiver, but you don't have to based on the way this offense has been built. But behind Elijah Moore, there are a couple of other receivers the Jets, I think, have high hopes for. One is a free agent signing from last year who did not really play all that well. They're hoping for a bounce back. And the other was a top 10 pick. We'll talk about Corey Davis and Garrett Wilson as we continue on this Thursday episode of Locked on Jets. I'll tell you, based on his play, the middle part of last season, Elijah Moore earned himself a couple Built Bars. Built Bars, the best tasting protein bar on the market. They're all covered in 100% real chocolate. And I have another great Built Bar to introduce you to. It's Cookie Dough Chunk Puffs. They have a light and chewy texture. They have real cookie dough chunks. And like all other Built Bars, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. It's all the joys of eating cookie dough without the hassle of making it. And it's healthy for you. It's only 160 calories with a whopping 15 grams of protein. And these are really good. I mean, they taste like cookie dough. If, you, if you're a cookie dough fan, you got to try these. They are utterly delicious. I'm a big cookie dough fan myself. I couldn't believe how good these were when I tried them. And what's great about Built is all of their bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently, and it provides tons of, tons of health benefits. And you're going to love the cookie, the cookie dough chunk puff. Whether you need a snack for your workout or a late night treat or to buy or to just get a quick bite, Built is the perfect protein bar and they taste better than a candy bar. You can ditch the calories, the fat, and the sugar. Go to Built.com and use promo code LOCK15. You'll get 15% off your order, whether it's the cookie dough chunk puff or any other Built bar. Again, it's promo code LOCK15, one word with no space, L-O-C-K-E-D, number one, number five, for 15% off at Built, B-U-I-L-T.com. Thank you again for making Locked On Jets your first listener, your first watch every day. We're free and available on all platforms, and we're talking about Zach Wilson's targets at wide receiver today. We talked about Elijah Moore, who I think is going to be the best receiver on the team, and I have very high hopes for Elijah Moore if he can stay healthy. Behind him, a guy people aren't as high on. That's Corey Davis, a guy who took a lot of criticism last year. And his failures were pretty obvious. I mean, he dropped a lot of passes. And I think Corey Davis is going to bounce back just because... Through his career, he's been a better player than he showed last year. I think part of the problem with Corey Davis is people had this impression that the Jets were paying him to be like a top five receiver in the league. Here's the thing, though. The top receivers in the league, they're getting contracts in excess of $25 million. They're pushing $30 million in annual salary. Corey Davis's annual salary on his current contract is only $12.5 million. Last year, Jets entered the season... You knew Jamison Crowder was not really a go-to guy. Elijah Moore was a rookie. You did not know what to expect from him. So I think people expected Corey Davis to be this absolute, you know, the guy they ran the passing game through. And I'm not sure that's fair to Corey Davis. Corey Davis is more of a complimentary player, but he's a good complimentary player. And even last year, you know, people remember the play against Denver when he did not come down with the ball on the Zach Wilson scramble. People remember the game against New England where he could have caught Zach Wilson second of Zach's four interceptions in the game. People tend to forget he played a big game week one against Carolina, played a tremendous game in the overtime victory against his former team, the Titans. It wasn't all bad for Corey Davis. In fact, he was on pace for roughly a thousand yards last year. It wasn't it wasn't all terrible. Now, he's kind of a limited player, but he's a guy who works the intermediate zones really well or has through his career. He's a he's been a better contested catch guy than he showed last year. Listen, Corey Davis is not the kind of guy who's going to be a superstar. I'm not sure you can expect him to make a Pro Bowl. But I think he's a guy who can be a good second or maybe third option in the passing game. And that's what the Jets need. If the Corey Davis goes back to being the player he was this last couple of years in Tennessee, that's going to be what they need because they have other pieces. They This offense has a lot of receivers who have some potential. This offense has some depth to it on the, at the receiver position. They just need Corey Davis to be a supporting player. Again, work the intermediate routes, come up with contest, do a better job with contested catches, 
do a better job not dropping passes. But I think Corey Davis can bounce back this year. Garrett Wilson's an interesting case because you never know what to expect from a rookie. But to me, the odds are very high. I'm, I'm never going to use the phrase that the, the guy is a safe pick, or maybe I've used it in the past, but there's never a player who's 100% safe. And listen, everybody's floor is bad. There, there's not a player who enters the NFL who has a floor that they're going to be, that they're automatically going to be a good player no matter what. But the odds of Garrett Wilson being a complete zero in this league, I think are much lower than a lot of other players. I'll take, give you an example. Somebody like a Traylon Burks who Tennessee drafted this year, I could see a scenario where he's very good. But he's so unrefined in so many key parts of his game that if it doesn't click for him, you're not going to get anything out of him. I'm not saying you. I'm not saying it's a guarantee he's going to be a bust because I. I think there are lots of traits that are good with him. I think that he's a guy who brings a lot to the table, and if it clicks for him, it could click in a big way. But if it doesn't click for Traylon Burks, it's going to be rough. I think the same thing could be said of Drake London, the guy who went ahead of Garrett Wilson in the draft. If it clicks for Jake Drake London, he could be really good, but. There are enough flaws in Drake London where if it doesn't click, he's not going to be that great. Garrett Wilson, if it clicks for him, he's going to be really, really good. I think he could be as good as any receiver in this class. If it doesn't click for him, listen, anybody could be a complete zero, but Garrett Wilson brings certain refinements to his game when you talk about his movement skills, when you talk about his route running ability, that I think it's less likely than any of the other receivers that He's going to be a total zero. You know, I, I hate using the term safest pick, but if we're talking about just odds of being a complete just guy who can't do anything, I think Garrett Wilson's going to be able to do something because of his ability to change directions, because of his speed, because of his route running. Maybe he's not a number one type receiver. And I think he could be. You know, I think people who are writing him off as a number one receiver are not being fair to him because he could be really good. He could be, he could be eventually grow into a go-to. I'm not expecting it this year, but I think he's going to be a player. I think the odds are really good. He's going to be at least a player in some capacity. He's going to be at least some sort of quality starter, even if he doesn't reach his full potential. And part of that is he's, he's another guy who can make plays with the ball in his hands. He's another guy you can manufacture touches for in space. And again, I think when the Jets are building this offense, they want to maximize Elijah Moore's touches. They want, they, you know, they, Elijah Moore may not be a heavy usage. He'll be a heavy, I mean, he's not saying he's going to be a guy who gets two touches a game, but he's not a guy you're going to scheme a ton of touches for. You need to pick your spots with somebody like Elijah Moore. And Garrett Wilson allows you to do that because he's another guy who's very good with the ball in his hands in space. So he's a guy you can throw screens to. He's a guy you can throw those smoke routes to. He's a guy maybe you can line up in the backfield, give a couple outside carries to. You can run some end arounds for him. You can run some jet sweeps for him. And in the Jets' offense last year, that became a, one of their staples. I mean, they used a lot of those quote-unquote gadget plays, and they were utilizing Elijah Moore quite a bit through the middle of the season. Well, a guy like Garrett Wilson in that role can help keep Elijah Moore fresh. And you look at the way this offense is built, Elijah Moore, lots of speed. He could maybe be a deep threat. Corey Davis has made a career out of working the intermediate parts. Garrett Wilson could be a really good player in the short areas of the field. I, I think he could play. It's going to be interesting to see how the Jets utilize the slot. I talked about it a little earlier. I can see Garrett Wilson being great in the slot, running option routes. Um, you know, when he makes a cut, it's a very sharp cut. He can create easy separation, which is something that you want in a slot receiver. So the pieces fit. And even though there may not be the traditional number one guy here, because you've got this running game, because you've built this running game with a strong offensive line in these backs, you don't need to be as receiver dependent. And by the way, you also have a couple of tight ends who you've brought in who have shown that they, listen, I'm not sure this is the greatest tight end group in the league, but you're not running Ryan Griffin out there anymore. Hallelujah. We're not running Ryan Griffin out there anymore. I mean, I, how many if you follow this podcast for three years? I've been waiting to say that, but waiting to say we're not running Ryan Griffin out there anymore. But the tight ends can also take some of the load off the receivers. Ultimately, I think that this is a team that can, where the roster construction, especially on the offensive side of the ball, the more I think about it, the more it really makes sense. And at the end of the day, if you're going to build an offense like this, you need quality receivers. You don't necessarily need the greatest receiving room in the league. And this this is not the greatest. It's a receiving room with potential. Two guys who were early picks in the last two years. So the ceiling is pretty high. But the expectations, I don't know that your expectations should be that this is the greatest receiving group in the league, but it doesn't need to be. You need quality receivers. 
And I think the Jets have given Zach Wilson some quality receivers. But these are not the only receivers on the roster. There are a couple of other guys who will try and make a name for themselves. There's one guy who showed he was a pretty decent role player last year in Braxton Berrio. So we'll talk about receivers lower on the depth chart as we continue on this Thursday episode of Locked On Jets. Of course, we talk about the Jets on this podcast, but I'd like to take a second to talk about a topic that's more serious, and that's mental health. And it's something we've learned more and more about in recent years. It's really important, just as you take care of your body physically, it's important to take care of your mental health. It's just as important. And these last couple of years have been really tough on a lot of us. Um, so figure out a way to make sure you take the time you need to take care of your mental health. And maybe better help can assist with that. BetterHelp Online Therapy, they'll assess your needs and they'll match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. It's not a crisis line and it's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online and it's available to people worldwide. You can log on to your account anytime and you can send a message to your therapist. And with therapy, it can take a few tries to find the right fit. So BetterHelp makes it easy and free to change therapist if you need to. It's more affordable than traditional online therapy and financial aid is also available. BetterHelp is a great way to invest in yourself and they have a special offer for listeners to Locked On Jets. You can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on. Again, that's 10% off your first month of online therapy at betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. No matter what, you should really take a second. You should take time during the day to make sure you're meant to make sure you're focusing on your mental health and perhaps better help can help you out. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Thursday. We're talking about Zach Wilson's wide receivers. We've talked about the three starters. We've talked Elijah Moore. We've talked Corey Davis. We've talked Garrett Wilson. How about the guys lower on the depth chart? Well, we can begin with Braxton Berrios. Jets gave him a contract this offseason, $6 million a year. We know he was an all-pro return guy this year. I'm sorry, you don't give a guy $6 million a year in today's NFL just to play in the return game. I think the Jets are going to utilize him on offense this year. And what role is he going to be? Well, it's going to be probably similar to the role I've been talking about. A guy who maybe can help the Jets keep Elijah Moore on a pitch count, especially early in the season last year. As the season moved along after Moore got hurt, the Jets used Berrios in that role, manufacturing touches for him, getting him the ball in space. You know I've never understood why teams that have good return guys refuse to manufacture touches for those guys in space. Because what they're good at is making plays in space with the ball in their hands. So why wouldn't you use them that, in that way? So Barrios, along with Garrett Wilson, I think will help in that area. Also shown to be a pretty useful backup slot receiver. I think the Jets will may, may rotate guys into and out of the slot more frequently. But if there's an injury, Barrios steps up and you'll maybe be a little bit more rigid because Barrios is going to be a slot receiver. So maybe you go back to last year where you have defined outside guys and Barrios is a defined slot receiver. But I think Barrios has a role on offense this year. The same cannot be said for anybody else on this list. I mean, you've got Denzel Mims, who apparently, you know, reports are the early stages of camp are pretty good for him. I'll say it again. Don't read too much into training camp practices. Listen, I want to believe Denzel Mims is going to step up this year, but I, I've seen this with so many guys where I, I go to bat for them. And I, I love Denzel Mims when they picked him in the second round in 2020. I mean, I'm done going to bat for these guys. Chris Herndon was the end for me. How many times did I defend Chris Herndon through the years? So, you know what? Denzel Mims got to show it to me. He's apparently playing a lot with the third team. We'll see. Uh, listen, he's got the, the ability to be a good receiver in the league. Uh, something just hasn't been clicking with him. I, I don't know what it is, but Mims has gotten to the point where I'll believe it when I see it. And beyond behind him, you have a bunch of other young guys who are kind of trying to find their place in the league. Jeff Smith, who was one of the stars of the offseason program out of Boston College, a former quarterback in college. You know, he, he's been on the team a couple of years. Jets are tr trying to find a role for him. Uh, Jets maybe are hoping he'll step up. I, I'm not sure. You have a guy, Calvin Jackson, out of Washington State, an undrafted rookie. Richard Davis, out of James Madison. Irvin Charles, out of Indiana, Pennsylvania. And Tariq Black, who has the distinction of being the, the guy who wore number three in the Buffalo game last year. You saw him, and I think everybody, all of us were saying, who the heck is that guy? Uh, you have, and finally, you, you have a guy out of Kent State, uh, Keyshawn Abram. So those are those are the guys lower on the depth chart competing for the last roster spot. I mean, I think four guys have locks on a roster spot. They are Elijah Moore, 
you got Corey Davis, you've got Garrett Wilson, you've got Braxton Berrios, everybody else, it's kind of up for grabs. Hopefully Denzel Mims can show us something. Again, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it when it comes to Denzel Mims. I've been burned too many times by guys I had hopes for who have given me no reason for hopes. But I think you obviously focus on the top four. Is this top four a spectacular four? No, but in the context of everything else the Jets have, in the context of this offense likely being a heavy run offense, does this have potential? Could this be good enough for Zach Wilson? I think absolutely. Anyway, that's all for our show today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Once again, a big shout out to subscribers to this podcast. Hit that subscribe button. You'll never miss an episode. Please a big thumbs up on YouTube if you're watching there. And a five-star review if you are listening on a podcast source. Have a great Thursday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to close out the week.